Great. Um, so, yes, yeah, so this morning we're going to carry on our series of looking at lessons from different um, stories, different um, incidents in the Bible. And this morning we're looking at the story of the unmerciful servant, um, a story of eternal lockdown. And hopefully that will make sense as we... Um, it sounds horrible, doesn't it? Um, that hopefully that will make sense as we go through. So why don't we read it? Um, and it starts this way. It says, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt, and let him go. Then, but when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow, fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me, I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant, just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from the heart. It's quite a story and it's a bit of a it's a bit of a ridiculous story i mean as a as a method of storytelling it's quite um it uses some really interesting techniques um because it's a fascinating story it starts with um peter coming to jesus and saying how many times do we need to forgive how many times and um and this question is a betrayal of, of peter's mindset this question says that peter um, doesn't understand what forgiveness is about. You see, he's thinking about it in some sort of transactional way. The law says that to please God, to be right with God, to get into heaven, to do the right thing, I have to forgive a certain number of times. How many times do I have to forgive to keep God happy before I can get my revenge? I can take my vengeance. I can not forgive and get my own back. This person who I'm forgiving seven times can get their commitments. There's a there's a heart in here that says forgiveness isn't about forgiveness. Forgiveness here is just about how many times I have to do the right thing for God to be happy with me. And so I, there's a story that um, I remember from my childhood about this um, guy who's in Scotland, and he was a he was a championship boxer, um, heavyweight boxer and, and and he became christian so he's this tough guy from the um from the streets in in glasgow and he became he became a christian and so he stopped boxing and um started doing some street evangelism stood outside the local bars and whatever talking about jesus and um and so he became a bit of a local story and um, there was one evening and he was out there telling people about Jesus and their um, need to receive the love that Jesus had um, poured out for them and how much God loved them and, and that they needed to repent and all this sort of stuff and and this guy this another guy came staggering out of the pub and maybe he'd had a few and whatever and he and he saw this guy preaching he goes oh you're the boxer and you're not so tough now and started heckling him and started shouting at him and the guy just kept on boxing, just kept on preaching and he kept on preaching and then this and then this um the guy from the pub he got a little bit of bravado maybe and he got got a little bit cocky and he saw that this guy wasn't fighting back and so he walked up to the guy and he punched him and the crowd gasped and everyone kind of didn't quite know what was going to happen. 
and the boxer held up his Bible and he said, the good book tells me to turn the other cheek. And he carried on preaching. Well, emboldened by this, this, uh, this guy walks up to him again and punches him on the other cheek. And the guy holds up his Bible again and he says, the good book gives me no further instructions. And decks the guy, one punch, knocks him out cold. And whilst that might be a really funny story, again, it kind of, it betrays this lack of understanding about actually what, what Jesus is talking about. It betrays this lack of understanding because it kind of goes, oh, well, I just have to follow the rules. Forgiveness isn't actually about anything between me and the person. Forgiveness is about between me and God. And if I follow the rules right, if I do the right things. And, and that's what Peter's betraying here. How many times do I have to forgive? And Jesus gives this ridiculous answer. He goes, not seven times, 77 times. And I don't think what Jesus is saying is, now what I want you to do is to go home and I want you to put a chart on the wall with 77 boxes in it. And every time you forgive this person, I want you to take it off. And when you've ticked off all 77, then, I mean, it's over to you. Do your worst. Like, take it out on the guy. Get your vengeance. Like, because you're clear, like, God's happy. No, no. Like, 77 is a, isn't a specific number. 77 is to go more times than you can count. Just forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive. What he's saying is, quit counting. Quit counting. Forgiveness isn't about that. And then to illustrate his point, Jesus says, let me tell you a story. There's a king, and he is um, he's working through his accounts. Who owes him? Because that's how that's how kings operated in these days. They would, who's been using my land, who's been following my land, or who's living in some of the houses that I own, or who have we who have, which little which villages have we gone to defend with our troops? And they need to pay us now for use of our troops, or whatever it might be, or who have we lent money to and, and, and they need to pay it back. And so he's going through his accounts of who owes him money and, and who's paid and who hasn't paid. And this guy gets brought before him who owes 10,000 bags of gold. Now, to you and I, you might go, oh, 10,000 bags of gold, that sounds like quite a lot, but I don't quite know how much that is. But 10,000 bags of gold is a ridiculous amount of money. This guy owes 10,000 bags of gold. Let me break this down for you. One bag of gold is equal to about 20 years of wages. Not 20 days, not 20 months, 20 years of wages is one bag of gold. If you take the national living wage, that works out at about, um, about £350,000. So one bag is 20 years of wages. So 10,000 bags is two hundred thousand years of wages or three and a half billion pounds a ridiculous amount right which servant owes that much and people listening to this story as jesus is telling it must be going oh my goodness like this is a ridiculous story what a nonsense story who owes three and a half billion pounds who owes ten thousand bags of gold and then it gets more ridiculous because the guy goes oh just give me a little bit more time and i'll pay you back with what how are you going to pay back three and a half billion pounds how are you going to pay back two hundred thousand years of wages with just a little bit more time and so he begs and he begs and he begs and then the king does an extraordinary thing says he has compassion on him. And the word here for compassion in the Greek is splagnon, which means compassion, the capacity to feel deep emotions. It comes from our guts and intestines. It's like pity or sympathy, our bowels. It comes from deep within us. This king sees the man himself. He doesn't just see the debt, however huge, the 10,000 bags of gold. It's, he sees the man 
and he has in the very depths of himself compassion. That's about relationship. He has compassion for the guy and he does this extraordinary thing. He goes, don't worry about the debt. I'll forgive you all the debt. He doesn't go, tell you what, I'll give you a bit more time. Well, let me, let me reduce the debt a little bit. Well, let me make it interest free. He doesn't do any of that stuff. He just goes, forget the debt. We're not going to operate in that system anymore. That transactional system. You see, this debt that he has is a transaction. He's borrowed money or he's, he's and, and now he has to give it back. It's a transaction. And, and, what the, and what the king does here is goes, let's just stop playing by those rules all together. I'm just going to wipe off the debt. I'm just going to clear it. You're free to go. You see, grace is not transactional. And love is not transactional. Because grace doesn't say, well, if you do this and if you do that and if you follow these rules and if you believe things, then, well, yeah, God will let you off. That's still transactional. You see, so much of our thinking is transactional. So much of how we operate, our culture is transactional. Who has the most? Who owes who what? Who's where on the rankings? Who, who are the top hundred richest people in the in the UK or the in the world and who are the people who've got the most and who are the people who've got the least and who owes who what and who sits where on the on the on the ladder of status and, and in, in society and so we have this whole way of thinking about transactional and so we bring that to our faith as well we bring it into our faith we go oh well so if I do all these things for God or if I believe all the right things or if I do all the right things if I follow all the rules then then if, then am I good enough then will God forgive me then will God love me then will God let me off and, and, and Jesus goes to huge lengths to try and dismantle this mindset and we're not going to operate in that mindset anymore you see you know love is transactional if I love you will you love me back if I do this for you, will you do this for me? If I meet these, this need in you, will you meet this need in me? And this is sometimes how our marriages function. And this is sometimes how our friendships function. And this is how sometimes how our family dynamics function. And we do things for people, but then we kind of hold it over them. And we kind of go, well, you know, I did that for you, so you should really do that for me. That is transactional love that doesn't, go to good places. It doesn't meet our need. And so we find ourselves chasing and chasing the affirmation. Tell me that I'm doing well. Tell me that I'm enough. Tell me that I'm really good at something. Tell me that I'm loved. Tell me that I'm needed. Tell me. And we seek this affirmation and we seek it from people and we seek it from their actions and we seek it from their words and we seek it from all from gifts and all this sort of stuff. And we have this sort of transactional attitude to love and this transactional attitude to forgiveness and we're always trying to be enough and we're always seeking for more and more and more but whatever we get what we discover is it's not enough and so you see people um who really are at the top of their business i heard a story this week about um really famous you know one of the most famous singers in the world and it's in the contract of all their staff members, all the people who work for this singer, they have to tell her every day that she's beautiful and that they love her. But it's in their contract. That's transactional love, right? Because I mean, your contract is you have to tell me that you love me and that I'm amazing and that I'm fabulous and that I'm beautiful every day. That's not, no wonder it doesn't feel like enough. Right, and you see people getting to the top of their business, and you see these movie stars and these rock stars and whatever, and then you see them plunging into depression or even suicide. And because it's not enough, it doesn't matter how much we have; it's not enough when our love is transactional, when our affirmation, when our um, identity is so transactional. And we do this in our faith; we make love transactional. We do this in our faith; we make forgiveness transactional. And this story is saying, you know, there's a different thing going on here. But it's a difficult um, thing to try and get our head around. 
So this story carries on. And this story carries on. This guy's forgiven. He's been forgiven of everything. And he goes out. And as he goes out, he finds this guy who owes him a hundred silver pieces. Now, hundred one silver piece is a day's pay. So a hundred is about three months, three, four months pay. So um, again, working on the same sort of strategy, maybe it's about 5,000 pounds. So this guy owes him about 5,000 pounds, which compared to three and a half billion isn't very much, is it? And but he owes him, for, and he grabs him, and he chokes him because when we get into transactional, that's when violence comes in, that's when power games come in, that's when we conflict with each other. And so he grabs him, and he chokes him, and he demands the money, and the money, and the guy says, well, "Just give me a little bit more time." He uses the exact same words that this guy gave to the king, but he doesn't show any of the same grace, and he has the guy thrown into prison. You see, what's happened here is the guy has received grace. He has received forgiveness. He has received love. But he doesn't know how to not live in that transactional mindset. He's missed what has happened to him. He's missed the love that he's received. He's missed the forgiveness that he's received. He's missed the grace that he's received. And so he's still living in this transactional system. You owe me, you need to pay me. You know, there's verses in the Bible that say, lend people, lend people money and things without ever expecting it back. That's a tough thing to follow, right? But it's again, it's Jesus trying to encourage us, trying to teach us how to break out of this transactional system. And for this guy, he couldn't do it. And so it gets really interesting because the king hears about this and he calls him back in. And he says, now I'm going to, put you in prison until you can pay back everything you owed. Well, if he couldn't pay it back before, how is he going to pay it back when he's in prison? And the king says some really difficult things. He says that you're going to be tortured and you're going to be in prison. And this is how God will teach you, treat you, if you're not able to forgive. We should kind of go, wait a minute. Are you saying that God is going to torture me? Are you saying that God's going to put me in prison and God's going to punish me? God's Gonna, but actually, I think Jesus is saying something different here. I think what Jesus is saying here is, if you insist on living in that transition, transactional system of forgiveness and love, if you insist on your love being transactional, I do this for you, so you do this for me. Your relationships being transactional. I've done this for you, so now I expect you to do this for me. After all these things I've done for you, you should be able to do this for me. And so we live resenting people and we live in anger and we live in jealousy and we live in pain. We live in torture because it's unquenchable. It's unsatisfiable. We live in torture and we live in captivity of comparison. We live in the captivity of jealousy and resentment and always needing more. If we are unable to free ourselves from this transactional mindset of love and forgiveness, of needing more all the time, of needing affirmation all the time, then we will live in captivity to ourselves, to our own need for more. We will live in torture because it will never be enough. Does that make sense? You see, but what the king offers here and what Jesus offers here is a new way of thinking that says that we are able to forgive when we understand how much we have been forgiven. We are free to love when we know how much we are loved. You see, where does it come from? See, if we're trying to forgive so we're forgiven, we've got it the wrong way around. If we're trying to love so we're loved, we've got it the wrong way around. Because we have been forgiven so much, we are able to forgive everything. Because we know how much we are loved, then we are able to love freely. 
And this is some of what we were talking about with Alan, the message that Toby put in, was saying you, you are so assured of your love and how much you are loved in Jesus that you are able to express love to so many people. You see, we always think, we fall into this trap of thinking that we have to earn God's love. We fall into this trap of thinking that we have to be enough, that we have to strive harder, we have to work harder, we have to do more, we have to push harder. But what if God already loves you? What if God already loves you? What if you don't have to earn it? What if love really does win? What if you're already forgiven? Not just everything you've done, but everything you're going to do. What if it's all forgiven? And not just you, but all the people around you. What if it's all forgiven? What if the price is already paid? What if God's already done it whilst we were still sinners? Jesus showed his love for us. Jesus paid the price for us whilst we were still sinners, before we'd even thought about a path that could be different. Jesus had done it. What if you are already enough? What if we don't have to strive? What if God has already said, look, I love you and you're enough? I just, I love you. What if all we have to do is let go? What if all we have to do is quit counting? What if all we have to do is quit comparing? What if all we have to do is stop trying so hard to be good enough, to do it all? What if all we have to do is trust God? What if all we have to do is let God love us? Because it's so difficult sometimes to let God love us. But what if all we have to do is just recognize how loved we are by this God who is love? And we let go. What if all we have to do is let go? Quit fighting, quit counting, quit striving. Let God love us. What if all we have to do is let go and learn to live in it? Learn to live in the love that we have. Learn to live in the forgiveness that we've received. Love isn't something that we're chasing all the time. What if we are surrounded by love? In Ephesians chapter 3, it says this. And I ask him, I ask God, that with both feet planted firmly on love, you'll be able to take in with all followers of Jesus the extravagant dimensions of Christ's love. Reach out and experience the breadth. Test its length. Plumb the depths. Rise to the heights. Live full lives, full in the fullness of God. This verse in Ephesians 3 talks about the vastness of God's love. It's so broad, it's so high, it's so deep. It's so much more. It's like this image of jumping into the ocean. What if that's all we have to do? to jump in. What if that's our response? You know, I, I wonder whether this morning, and um, we haven't figured out how to do response really yet, but we're gonna give it a go. Um, I wonder if this morning there's a response for us. Maybe as I've been talking about this transactional way of thinking, you've recognized something in yourself. Maybe how we do love, maybe our attitude to forgiveness, maybe you're consumed by this not enough, or maybe you recognize when I talk about torture and I talk about being hemmed in and bound in and imprisoned by our comparison and resentment and anger and jealousy and all those things maybe that really resonates with you and maybe you've always think 
felt like you have to prove something to God, or maybe you've always had this attitude of going, oh, I know, I know, yeah, but I'm so bad. Like, God, I don't think God could forgive me. Oh, I don't think God loves me. I don't think I'm lovable. Maybe I'm, maybe, you know, I, I get that he loves other people, but probably not me. I don't really think that's about me. I think there's an invitation this morning for us to jump in, to reach out and experience the breath, test its length, plumb the depths, rise to the heights, live full lives, full in the fullness of God. There's an invitation for us to jump in and experience the vastness of that ocean of love. You are already loved. You are already enough. You are already forgiven. We just need to learn to live in it.